Hey, welcome to another lesson on Make Science Easy. Today we are looking at some more scientific literacy and we're going to be doing about how to draw graphs. Graphing skills are some of the most important things in all of science. I know that a lot of people say, well, you can draw them on computers, but being able to hand draw a graph is still a vital skill. Why are graphs so important? Well, simply put, graphs convey data in a visual form. Having numbers on a page is really useful, but having them in a visual form that's easily accessible can highlight information that you may not have otherwise noticed and can really be used to illustrate your point. Graphs also help to identify patterns and trends, and it's far faster to do this in a graph than it is just with raw data. And we can also identify data outliers. Data outliers are points that don't fit a pattern, perhaps results that are incorrect. Again, it's easier to do this in a graph than it is just with the data on its own. And finally, we can identify a lot of mathematical relationships from our graphs. Now, there are different types of graphs, and each one needs to be used in a slightly different way. So the four main types are bar charts, line graphs, scatter graphs, and pie charts. Line graphs and scatter graphs are pretty similar, but bar charts and pie charts are not. So each set of graphs should be used to represent different types of data. Now, any good graph has the following features. It doesn't matter what type of graph it is. Every graph needs to have a title. That title should say what the graph is about. The axes should be drawn and they need to be drawn with a ruler. You cannot draw a graph freehand and you need to use pencil. That way you make any mistakes, easy to correct. The Y axis is the vertical axis and the X axis is the horizontal axis. We don't label them X and Y in science, but it's important you know which is which. Our dependent variable is always plotted on the Y axis. The dependent variable is the thing that we are measuring in our experiment. The independent variable always goes on the x-axis. The independent variable is the thing that we are changing in our experiment. Our axes need to be labeled and those labels must include units. We also need to put our numbers on our graph. They need to be evenly spread out and you need to make sure your graph is taking up a good amount of the page. So here about two thirds, a bit more. You must, must, must evenly spread your units and use the major axis lines to plot your numbers, at least when you're starting off with your units. First type of graph we're going to look at are bar charts. Now, these are simple charts and they are used to plot data that we call discontinuous data or discrete data. Discrete data is data that only has set values. So things like eye color, types of power station, or shoe size. Now, it's the independent variable that is normally discontinuous or discrete. So the example we have here, we have the amount of fish landed by commercial trawlers. So we've got cod, haddock, or pollock. These are set variables. You cannot have a fish halfway in between cod or pollock. So we must use a bar chart to represent this. Now when we draw a good bar chart, we need to make sure that we follow the rules we set out earlier. Now on the right, I've included some data that we're going to use to plot. And this is eye color. So we have a title, eye color distribution. We plot our axes, X and Y, and along the bottom, we make sure we put eye color. This is because eye color is our independent variable. We plot the actual colors, so blue, brown, and green. And along the side, we have the number of people. This is our dependent variable. And again, we have numbers 20, 40, 60, 80. The reason why we've chosen 80 as our highest number is because if we look at our data, 64 is the most we have, so we want to have our highest number on our graph slightly larger than our highest data value. 
So, we want to plot blue eyes, 18 people. The easiest way to do this is to draw a very faint line or put a ruler on 18. We can then draw our bar to the correct height. For brown eyes, we have 64 people, so we draw our line going across from the value of 64. We can then plot the correct value for brown eyes. And again for green, we have 10, so we find where the line measures 10. We draw a line across or put our ruler on, and then we draw up to 10, so we have them at the correct height. It is no good just guessing where the values go. You need to draw ruler lines because that will highlight the exact point. Draw these faintly and they can be rubbed out after. A high quality chart for eye color distribution. A histogram is a special type of bar chart. Now histograms are used to represent continuous data that can be grouped together. A good example of this is ranges of ages, anything with a range really. It helps reduce the overall number of data points. And unlike a bar chart, both the X and Y values are drawn to scale. A line graph is perhaps the most commonly drawn type of graph you're going to come across in science, along with a scatter graph. Both are drawn in the same way. Line graphs are generally used to plot a set of data against time. But they can be suitable for any type of continuous variable. Line graphs always need to have a line of best fit, and it's possible to plot multiple line graphs on a single set of axes. Now, if we look here, time in this example is our independent variable. It's going to go along the x-axis. Speed is going to be our dependent variable. It's going to go along the y-axis. It's always vital that we get the correct axes for the correct set of data. Scatter graphs, very, very similar to line graphs. In fact, they are a type of line graph, and they show the relationship between two different sets of data. So, individual data points are plotted onto the graph. Once all of those data points are plotted, if there is a trend, that line of best fit can be shown. Let's have a look at how we can draw these types of graphs. So here, we have a set of data. We've got volume of hydrogen produced, and time. So this experiment could well be reacting acid with metal, say magnesium, we are going to produce hydrogen gas, which we can measure. So which of these two sets of data is independent? Is time independent or is volume of hydrogen independent? Well, time is nearly always going to be our independent variable. There are some exceptions where it's not, where we maybe are measuring how long it takes for a reaction to occur, but generally time is independent. So we write our title. We plot time along the bottom, along our x-axis. We include our units. We put our numbers in, all evenly spread. Along the y-axis, we put the volume of hydrogen, we put our unit, and we put our numbers evenly spread. We now need to plot our points. Now, the first one is very easy. Zero seconds have passed, and the volume of hydrogen is zero. So it goes to a point called the origin, which is zero, zero. Now, if you notice how I've drawn these, I've drawn them as a plus sign. This is because you can follow the lines very easily. You can follow a line going vertically and horizontally. To make things easier to see, I have drawn these pluses larger than they should be drawn. They should be drawn with a thin line, but I've made them big so you can see them. So our first data point is plotted pretty easy. We now need to plot our second data point. So the time is 10 seconds. So we draw a line with a ruler going up from 10 seconds. If we now look at the volume of hydrogen produced, we can see it's 50 centimeters cubed. So we draw another line going across from 50 centimeters cubed. Where our two lines intersect each other is where our data point must be plotted. Now we can follow with the horizontal and vertical line of our plus point. We can follow our two lines that have been drawn. So we now have our point plotted. The lines we've used can then be rubbed out, leaving only the data point. We then follow this procedure again, 
at 20 seconds. We draw a line up from 20 because that is our time and we draw a line across at 100 because that is our volume. Where the two lines meet we draw our data point. And this continues and we can keep on plotting our data points using the same method drawing a line each time and where these lines intersect we plot our point. You will eventually come to a point where you don't need to do this but it is a very simple and easy way of getting perfectly plotted points every single time. Now when we look at our data it's very obvious that our lines or our data points all match up in a perfect line. So we can draw with a ruler a straight line and we can draw a line of best fit going through all of this point. This is our trend line. We're going to look at how we can use this trend line later on but for now it's just important that we know how to draw them. Pie charts are another really important type of chart and they're used quite differently to the other charts we've seen so far. Pie charts are really good at showing data that's distributed between different categories. So if we look at the pie chart that we can see, we can see we're looking at how electricity is generated throughout the world. And the different categories are obviously the different methods of producing electricity. In a pie chart, each section of the pie normally shows a percentage or a fraction. So long as our fraction adds up to 1 or our percentages add up to 100, a pie chart is a very good way of showing this kind of data. So as we've already seen, a good example could be power generation or population distribution within a habitat. Now, we need to know how to draw a good pie chart. And in order to draw a high quality pie chart, you do need two pieces of equipment. You will always need a protractor and a pair of compasses. Without this equipment, you cannot draw a good pie chart. Most pie charts represent data in percentages. So, in a circle, 1% is going to be equal to 3.6 degrees. The reason for this is a circle has 360 degrees in total. So, 360 degrees divided by 100 equals 3.6. If we have 100%, then we have 360 degrees. Let's look at an example of this. And we could use the example of the composition of gases in our atmosphere. We can see that nitrogen makes up 78% of our atmosphere. Oxygen makes up 21% of our atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, 0.04% of our atmosphere. And argon, 0.9% of our atmosphere. In order to draw our pie chart, we need to convert these percentages into degrees. And the way we do that is we use the equation, the angle equals a percentage times 3.6. So, for example, with nitrogen, 78%, which is the composition of the atmosphere, times 3.6, which is the value for 1%, equals 280.8 degrees. So when we draw our pie chart for nitrogen, the pie for nitrogen needs to take up 280.8 degrees of our circle. So let's draw our pie chart. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to put a circle in the centre of our pie. This is obviously the centre. When we use our protractor and when we use our pair of compasses, this is the centre of the circle that we use. It's essential we always use the same point or our circle will not be drawn properly. It's then worthwhile drawing a vertical line from the centre of the circle to where the outside of the circle is going to be. So we're drawing a radius. We then measure 280.8 degrees. We know that half of the circle is 180, so we don't need to measure that. We then need to measure the other 100.8 degrees. That gives us a total of 280.8 degrees. When we found where 280.8 degrees is, we draw another radius line. What we now need to do, using our pair of compasses, is to join these two lines together. And we draw a circle. 
So we can see we've drawn our circle, or at least the section of the circle that represents nitrogen. We're now going to do this again for oxygen. So in this case, we need to multiply 21 by 3.6. This is going to give us the percentage of our pi for oxygen. When we've worked this out, we mark it on in the same way we did for nitrogen. Now that we have our pie chart completed, we need to label the different sections of the pie. What we'll also notice is that a good pie chart has the sections in size order. The largest section starts at 12 o'clock, so vertical, and moves round clockwise. The second largest section should be the second section clockwise, and so on. So we go from biggest to smallest, going in a clockwise direction. In summary. There are many different types of charts and graphs. Each one is used in a different circumstance. Bar charts are generally for discontinuous data. Line graphs and scatter graphs generally for continuous data. Pie charts are useful when fractions and percentages add up to 100%. And graphs can be used to identify trends and analyze data. Bar charts, line graphs, scatter graphs must always be drawn on graph paper, never on plain paper. The dependent variable always goes on the y-axis and the independent variable always goes on the x-axis. Line graphs and scatter graphs normally require a line of best fit.